Kristen Howerton, welcome to Shrinkwrap Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really glad to have you here. Uh, you've written a book titled Rage Against the Minivan, Learning to Parent Without Perfection. I'm sure that many mothers and fathers out there <laughs> will be eagerly uh, looking forward to reading that. Uh, we can touch on your book, but I'm most interested in the experiences as a mother of your experiences as a mother of a biracial family, since I grew up in one of those myself, and I've spoken about that part of, of my biography here on the podcast before. Uh, what can you tell us about your own family of origin to start way back? Yeah, my, my own family of origin, um, I was raised in Florida. My parents, um, I had two sisters. I was the oldest of two sisters. And my parents, you know, they really, um, they meant well as it came to educating us on race. But they, um, they sort of leaned towards what a lot of people did at the time, which was telling us to ignore race, right? So let's be colorblind. Let's not notice someone's race. Everyone is equal. Um, and so they meant well. Um, yeah. They were, you know, they were definitely correcting over their own parents who, you know, were, you know, my grandparents on both sides would, would verbally, you know, they would stereotype people based on race that would talk negatively about people based on race. And so my parents didn't want to instill that in us. And so what we were taught was just don't see someone's race. Don't ever uh -huh. comment on it. It's that colorblind ideology that, you know, is coming from the best of intentions. Um, but, you know, as I, as I then um, move forward in life, started to understand, like, it's actually not the best if I don't see someone's race, because then I'm not understanding their experience, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Then I'm, then I'm, then I, if I'm, if I'm saying everyone's equal, then when things aren't equal, I'm not able to empathize. I'm not able, you know, then I'm denying. Their, yeah, that's an interesting point. And yeah. Well, also, you're practicing a kind of denial, which could yes. spread into other areas of your yeah. life as well. Absolutely. To be, to be blind to other things yeah. that are important. Uh, yeah. Did you grow up in a particular religious context? I did. I was raised very evangelical Christian. Well, I've got some of that in my background as well, so I can yeah. really understand that. Um, <clears throat> what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you have a notion <laughs> about that when you were a kid? You know, what's funny is I knew that I wanted to be a psychotherapist from grade eight. I, really? I started research, researching colleges from grade eight. I don't know what, I don't know if it was, you know, a, a television dad who was a therapist who made me think that that looked like a cool job, but I wanted to help people, um, you know, and that just seemed like the best way to help people. And so I, yeah, I always kind of knew that I would be a therapist. Wow, that's great. Uh, I didn't know, I'd never heard about a therapist, I think, in grade eight. <laughs> uh, so that's great. And um, at what point did you get married? I got married very young. I got married um, when I was 21 in, in between um, my junior and senior year of college. Okay, so you were still in college. You had not yep. yet... Uh, become that therapist that you were seeking to no become. not not quite yet yeah, yeah what, what did you major in well it's funny I majored in undergrad I majored in theater and science so I had a double major so okay. I did musical theater through college which was lots of fun yeah I can um, but then I was also getting all those prerequisites that I needed because I knew I wanted to go on and get a master's uh-huh uh-huh and um uh, did you always want to have kids? Yes, I yeah. knew I always wanted to have kids. And I also knew from an early age that I wanted to adopt some of my children. Oh, really? You knew that even before you found out? I, I gather that you had some difficulty conceiving, but you, yes. but you already knew that you'd want to adopt anyway. I did. Yes. I remember I'm um, probably, you know, right around that same age range, probably middle school, reading a Time Magazine article and it was about the orphan crisis in Romania and how many children were there living without parents. And I just remember being so struck 
at that age of just like, what would it be like to grow up without parents? And that I remember that the article talked about institutionalization yes. and, um, you know, some of the psych psychological effects. And I was very keenly interested in psychology. And I just remember at that time thinking like, if you really wanted to help some, someone, you know, like this, this is the greatest way that you could help someone yeah. would be to make sure that they don't grow up in an orphanage. And I, I still feel that I, you know, I still, my, my views on adoption have changed some, but I still feel um, that, you know, as a society, we should make sure that no children are being raised in orphanages, whether that looks like, you know, rehoming them with their birth family or adoption. I just think an orphanage is, you know, psychologically a very not good place for a child yeah. to grow up. Yeah, really? And yeah. how did your hus husband feel about children and about adoption? He was game. He was game. I mean, I think that I was probably a little more excited on the adoption front. You know, I, I would have been happy to adopt first. Um, and I think he was like, well, you know, maybe we should just, you know, have, have children, you know, biologically, and then we can adopt. And I, I was kind of game to, to do either first. Yeah. So what tipped you over to the edge? Because you did end up adopting first. I did adopt first. Well, we did attempt to get pregnant. Um, I did have some infertility issues, but my biggest issue was that I had recurrent pregnancy loss. And so I had four miscarriages um, before I adopted my first child. Okay. Yeah. We've, we've seen that happen even in, in our own family. Yeah. Uh, and I know it's, it's interesting how strong that it's interesting to me that that drive is so strong uh, that people end up spending a ton of money going through a lot of pain, you know, with the, the uh, miscarriages and so on. And, and uh, mm. yeah. So you say your, your views of adoption have changed in what way? You know, I think that I, I am still pro adoption, but I think I, I had some naive like ideas that adoption is always the solution. And I think now I'm, I think it's important for people to look at like, why are children removed from their birth family? And if the reason is poverty, you know, if a child's in an orphanage with living birth parents who just can't afford to care for them, then I think adoption is not the right answer for those children. You know, the right answer is resourcing that family to be able to keep their children. So yeah. I'm still very pro adoption for children who you know, have other reasons, like they can't be reunited with their birth family for reasons of, you know, perhaps they've, they've died, or, you know, perhaps they were abusive. Um, but I think that there are a lot of situations where kids are funneled into adoption, where they should probably be funneled back to a resourced birth family. Uh -huh. Now, you ended up adopting a little boy who also uh, was black. Uh, yes. Tell us about that. How did that happen? Yeah, so when, you know, when we first decided to adopt, um, I, I did know a bit about adoption and ethics at the time. And so, you know, I had done enough reading to know that I wanted to adopt a child who was waiting for a family. I didn't, I knew that there were a lot of families that were lined up waiting for that perfect, healthy, newborn white baby. And, and behind that, you know, behind those babies was a long queue of parents waiting. And I knew that I wanted the opposite. I wanted to sign up to adopt a child that was waiting for a family. Uh -huh. And I did know that that often meant an older child or a sibling set or a, ch a child that was not white. And so when we um, kind of applied with our agency, we said we were open to all of those things. So we were open to older kids. We were open to sibling sets. We were open to any race. Yeah. So the first child that we were uh, matched with was six months old, which is still pretty young. Um, and he was black. Yeah. Yeah. And was, um, so how did, how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, I mean, it has a happy ending. He is, you know, he is now my giant 15 year old roaming up roaming around upstairs, but um, it was it was really touch and go for several years um, because we adopted through the foster care system. So we were his foster parents first. Uh -huh. um, we were told that it looked, you know, very likely that he would be adoptable because his, his parents had their rights terminated um, for things that had happened even before he was born. Um, but then a relative emerged. And so for about three years, he was living with us, but there was a question as to whether or not he might end up living with the relative. And so, 
as it turns out, she ended up not completing the process. And so we were able to adopt him at age three and a half. Um, but that yeah, was, there was a lot of a difficult thing for you. Yeah. I don't know if he was aware of it, but to be in that no. sort of halfway place yeah. of yes, you want to bond with the child, but yep. you don't want to end up getting your heart broken when yes. somebody else adopts him. Yeah. And I, t I actually talk about that quite a bit in my book because, you know, that was one of my biggest learnings is, you know, I had to love him as if, you know, I, I couldn't mm -hmm. hold back. I couldn't, I couldn't say, well, I'm going to like only love him halfway because I don't know if he's staying. Like mm -hmm. I had to love him as if he'd be there forever. And that even if he went back, you know, to a birth relative, that would still have been the right thing for me to have done would be to have loved him as much as I could love him when I had him, regardless of how long I had him. So that was a big lesson for me and kind of unconditional love. Yeah. And, and how old were you when you adopted him? I was 30. You were 30. Okay. So you already had some maturity on you. But um, that's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. I know. <laughs> a, a bit though. Yeah. Be thinking that way. I was, yeah. By the way, you know, the way that you were looking at it, you know, struck me as a mature way to do that. And um, so then how did you come to adopt a second black boy? And yeah. You know, so what's interesting is in that period of time while we were waiting for um, ja to find out if Jafta's adoption would go through, I ended up getting pregnant and that pregnancy led to a baby. Um, I didn't lose that pregnancy. And so you know, I had Jafta and then I had, he had a, a younger sister um, who was less than two years younger than him. And he would, he would begin to say things like, I don't match, you know, everybody matches, but me. Wow. And I just intuitively felt that it was very important that he have a racially matched sibling, that he have another black person in the house. Like it just didn't feel right to me that he is you know, that, that all of us match and he doesn't. I mean, he was articulating yeah. even at three. It's like he was articulating that. Wow. And so I just knew that I wanted to give him a black sibling that he could, that could be a mirror to his racial experience and that he yeah. could experience that with and have someone in his family to relate to. And so um, I knew that I didn't want to do foster adopt again because it had just been very, you know, very fraught for us. And I had some connections to the country of Haiti. I had visited there when I was younger and had friends who worked there. And I knew that there were a lot of waiting children in Haiti in orphanages. Um, and so we began the process to adopt from Haiti and we were matched with our second son. Yeah. Well, again, I'm struck by the, the maturity of your, of your thinking and, and your response to his observation, I don't match. Yeah. It was heartbreaking. You know, it was really heartbreaking for, for me to hear that. And I, I understood it, you know, I, I totally understood it. And I, you know, now my boys are 13 and 15 and they're the best of friends. And I just think that that was truly the biggest gift I ever could have given him yeah. is this brother that he, you know, they, they can talk about these things with each yeah, other and, and they do. Yeah. yeah. I remember in my own situation, uh, uh, my mother was white. I was raised by a, a stepfather who was who was black, who they married, I think maybe even before I was born or right after I was born. He was there from the beginning of my recollection and um, and spent a lot of time in, in one of the black neighborhoods growing up in South L.A. And I remember kids who had my black friends would say, hey, man, what are you? And I would say, I'm half chocolate milk, half white milk. <laughs> I remember saying that. <laughs> and because, you know, I think I was pretty mixed up in some ways about, you know, just what the situation was. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but that was a way that satisfied me and seemed to stop yeah. questioning <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> at that point. Um, I never had the presence of mind to talk about matching. <laughs> I don't match. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, and your husband was cool, uh, with these, uh, with these adoptions and the interracial, uh, adoption. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I think I was probably the one who was like, Hey, let's do this. But once we, once we had decided to adopt, I mean, I think we both felt 
like, you know, we're open to the kids that need a home. And, you know, it, it felt for me, it just felt very wrong to stipulate, like we would only take a white child. That didn't feel right to me. Yeah. And then at some point, yet further down the road, you had another natural child, a, a little girl. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. So now so I have two biological daughters uh -huh. and two adopted sons. Yeah. And how has that interracial mix in the family been in terms of the siblings relating to one another? You know, I think they relate to each other like regular siblings. They're, you know, the best of friends and the worst of enemies on any given day. Yeah, and, right. um, you know, I think that, you know, the, the race stuff, I mean, when they were little, it, it didn't play much of a part at all. They, they were more concerned with, you know, playing with their tech decks or <laughs> building a fort in the living room. Sure. Um, you know, and I think as they've grown, I think that what I've observed is just um, for my white daughters, like they're, they're real activists. You know, I think that um, their ability to empath empathize and their ability to um, connect with injustice as white kids is, you know, I think it's on a more mature level because they, they have their black brothers. So they are yeah. seeing that experience yeah. in real life. And so, you know, they're, they're both very, very big allies and, you know, they like to go on marches and, you know, they're involved in black lives matter. Um, you know, I think it's, it, it has just helped open their eyes to yeah. issues of injustice. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually you and your husband divorce, uh, how yes. did that come about? Well, you know, it was about six years ago, and I think, I mean, I, I, I talk, it's, it's a nuanced thing, and I talk about it in the book. Um, it wasn't one thing, you know, but I think it was just years and years of us just kind of growing in different directions. Mm -hmm. um, but we have remained as a couple, you know, I think we've been able to um, co-parent pretty well. So he lived with us for a while. Um, I had at my property, I, there's a back house. And so he was in the back house and I was in the main house and the kids would just kind of come and go. Uh -huh. um, you know, we still do our holidays together. I mean, that was just important to us um, as much as we could to just still maintain a lot of, you know, family, sense of family together. Yeah. Yeah. So he's still in your lives. Oh, very much so. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, well, that's, that's wonderful for you for the kids to have that continuity. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, you always wanted to be a therapist. And at some point you went to school and became a uh, MFT, marriage family therapist. Yes. At what, at what point in all of this adventure did that happen? Um, I became a marriage and family therapist right out of, right out of college. So I went to grad school, you know, in my twenties, early twenties and got licensed very quickly. And so by 24, I was in private practice. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. No wonder you were able to come to some of these, uh, situations with the level of sophistication and, and empathy that you brought to it. So that's. That's good that you were able to achieve your girlhood dream. Yeah. The whole package, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. It is kind of yeah. funny. Therapists, kids, yeah. adoption. Yeah. 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 It was a long road to get there, but yes. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, I'm wondering what sorts of challenges you've run into, you face or continue to face as the mother of a biracial family. You know, yeah, I think, um, I think it's interesting because I think as a white mom, I have all of the same concerns that black moms have about their kids walking out in the world and, you know, those safety concerns as we, we see, you know, more and more footage being captured of um, run-ins with the police where, you know, black people are treated with more force, yeah. with less dignity. You know, um, there was footage that came out last week of, you know, a, a car full of black teenagers that somehow was sus suspect of being robbed and cops laying all these girls down, face down on the ground, youngest of them being six, you know. Right. We, right. I saw we're, that on the yeah, news. I mean, we're yeah. seeing more and more and 
Um, you know, so there's always those fears as your child leaves the house of like, you know, if they had some kind of an altercation or, or if they were wrongly accused, you know, could it lead to violence? And, you know, we're having these conversations constantly with the boys of like, okay, you know, when you interact with police, like you have to be more compliant than you think. And you, you know, you have to somehow show them that you're not a threat and you have to have your hands up. And, you know, it's, it's scary to have to have all these conversations with them that I don't have with my white daughters because I, I don't have the same fears there. Uh -huh. Do the kids, do you guys watch the news on TV? The news is so upsetting. How are you dealing with that? We do. We do. I mean, I try to be a little more selective with it, but, um, you know, my boys are 13 and 15 and they're both over six feet. So the thing wow. is like, they're walking around being perceived as black men. You know, oh. I mean, if, if, if someone sees them out of the corner of their eye, they look like black men. Yeah. adults. And I, t I have to tell them that all the time. You will be perceived as an adult. Yeah. So if you guys decide you're going to play hide and seek in the neighborhood and you hide behind a bush in someone's driveway, they're going to see a black man is in my bush. Yeah. And then they're going to take all their stereotypes that, that, you know, society has given them about what black men are and they're going to apply that to you and it could turn ugly. And so they always, you know, it's like that talk of like, you always have to be thinking of how you could be perceived in a situation. So yeah, we do, we watch the news. We, um, you know, we talk through, you know, every time there's a new, you know, a new interaction with police that's troubling, we'll watch it and talk it through. And yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's really difficult. Uh, Biden just chose uh, Kamala Harris from uh, California, yeah. a black woman uh, uh, to be his running mate. Uh, has that been uh, discussed in your family? Was there any excitement around that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're all excited. I think, you know, it's, it's exciting to, for it to be a woman and it's exciting for it to be a black woman. Yesterday we were in the car and we, you know, we listened to a podcast about, you know, why she was a great pick. And um, yeah, there's a lot of excitement around that for us. Yeah. Has it, a, did it, has it a, influence your choice of neighborhoods where you live? Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's definitely interesting. It's definitely influenced our school choices. Um, we live in a, in a, actually a very diverse neighborhood. Um, our neighbor, but our neighborhood, what's interesting is it's not a lot of black people. So we, our neighborhood has a lot of Asian Americans, Filipino Americans, and Mexican Americans, but we don't have a lot of black people. So it's diverse, but the boys are still very much in the minority. But the school that they attend um, is, about, I would say about 87% Latino, Latina, um, which is, I think, nice because even though, you know, even though my boys um, are still in the minority at that school, I, I just think that there's an affinity of minority groups. Um, yeah. Not that, the, not that it's always perfect, right. um, but it's nice that they have a diverse school where it's not just only white people yeah. and only white parents. Um, it's helpful. Yeah. Uh, what state do you live in, by the way? So we're in Southern California. Southern California. Okay. And uh, actually, Southern California on the whole, well, in some areas, is very conservative. Yeah. Right? Yes. And we are in, we are in Orange County. So Orange we are County, in that. Right. We right. are in that conservative famously, bubble. Famously conservative. But there's yes. a bubble, bubble there that you're in, you say? Yeah, although, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we did flip. We did finally flip in the last election. Um, Harley Rauda outed Dana Rohrbacher, who was, uh, you know, who was our representative for 20 years. He was a big Trump supporter, and Harley Rauda is a Democrat. So, you know, we did finally flip. The, the town that we live in specifically is pretty liberal. You know, Orange County, at the end of the day, is a conglomeration of very diverse towns. Mm -hmm. um, and the one that we happen to be in is, is very liberal. Yeah. So have, have there been any issues in schools uh, for you, either, either with the parents or the administrations? Any, any rough spots that you've had to deal with? I mean, yes, there has been. I would say that the stuff that my boys deal with tends to be on the microaggression level where, you know, it might look like a kid jokingly asking them if they can have the N-word pass or, um, 
you know, it's a lot of, of stuff along those lines. Yeah. Um, just ignorance, you know, kids being dumb, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, but, but they haven't had any negative interactions with law enforcement where we live. Um, you know, and I know a lot of people in law enforcement where we live. And I know that, you know, our particular um, police department has been very supportive of all the protests. You know, they showed up, they were facilitating, they were blocking traffic for us. So it does feel like at least in the town that we're in, um, there's some communication and cooperation there. Yeah, wonderful. And I was wondering if, if you as a mother ran into any difficulties with school administrators or other parents. It sounds like the, the situation is so integrated that that's maybe a non-issue. You know, I will say that the run-ins that I've had with other parents has actually probably been more so around um, prejudice towards our immigrant students, which we have a high population of. And, um, you know, there are some white parents who don't have the best view of that or who feel frustrated by um, you know, the volume of students that we have that are English learners. Um, and so probably the run-ins I've had have been around that topic because <laughs> I feel strongly that those students are bringing um, some really great diversity and learning experiences for our kids. I mean, my, my kids, you know, I mean, some of my kids, the majority of their friends are um, immigrants from Mexico. And it's, it's been like a real lovely addition to our life, yeah. you know, getting yeah. to know these families. Yeah. Um, so I think the run-ins I've had have, have just been around maybe some white ignorance mm -hmm. um, or prejudice towards immigrant, immigrant families in our area. Yeah. Um, what has sustained your inner world through all of this? Uh, uh, is that a fair question? <laughs> yeah, that's a fair question. I mean, I think, um, I think for one, knowing that it's important to let myself off the hook. And so, you know, with all of the tumult that's going on in the world right now between the pandemic and, you know, the national race conversation and protests, I think um, knowing that because all of this is happening and because I'm, you know, feeling involved and invested in all of it happening, that it's like, I don't need to try to be some perfect example of, you know, motherhood in all of this. Like I can be a good enough mom. I can be an okay mom, but like I can let some of it go. You know, it's, it's okay if I'm not cooking the most gourmet meals. It's okay if I, you know, if the kids are not studying all summer, you know, that I, I think just letting myself off the hook has been a big lesson in personal care. Um, and then a big one for me has just been getting out in nature. I, I just think that that for me is a huge reset button when I can shut down the computer, <laughs> shut down the news. I mean, I, you know, I think it's super important to stay informed, but, you know, to make sure that information intake is at a reasonable level and then finding life affirming things to do outside of that. Yeah. In fact, uh, let our <laughs> audience know that you're right now, you're in, uh, Brian, Bryce? Zion. We're in Zion. Zion. <laughs> yeah. Zion National Park. Yeah. And uh, during the pandemic. So yes. you've gotten away into nature and uh, kind of put a lot of this behind you for a bit. Yes. Yeah. I think yeah. I mean, it's idea. so interesting it's because I feel like my mental health has been exponentially better just, you know, and we're still like pop, you know, popping in and checking in the news at night, but you know, just to be away from home and out in nature has really been helpful for all of us. Oh, I can imagine. I can yeah. imagine. I, I forgot to ask you, too, if there were any uh, unexpected sources of support for mm -hmm. your different family arrangement. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that my local Black community has been incredibly supportive. My boys are involved in an organization called 100 Black Men, and they mentor um, teenage boys. And so my boys have gotten really involved there. Oh, that's um, I would say that um, it's been interesting as a white mom um, with black kids, how much I have really connected with other black moms, because I think there's a shared 
concern and experience there that some of my white friends don't understand. And so I've gotten an incredible amount of support um, just from some of the black moms in my community, which has been lovely and I'm yeah. super grateful for. Yeah, that's great. Um, and you've participated in some of the parades on Black Lives Matter. You, oh, yeah. Your kids had as a family. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and we had participated in them well before. I mean, you know, I went to New York and marched for Eric Garner. I mean, that's something we've been involved in for a long time. Yeah. Uh, how has your family been dealing with the pandemic? I mean, the pandemic has put us all on our heels. Yeah. Uh, to, to varying degrees. Are your kids going to be able to be in school or are they not in, are they going to be Zoom schooled? Well, that's the question of the day, isn't it? We are starting with Zoom. Um, I would prefer that they stay online, but that is not a decision that's that's up to me if I keep them in their current schools, but we're starting on Zoom and I'm, I'm hoping it'll stay that way. We've We've taken a pretty conservative approach. I mean, it, you know, I'm kind of of the opinion that it's this is one of those moments that, you know, collectivism and, you know, looking out for our fellow man is a thing we all kind of need to do. So we've been pretty strictly quarantined. Uh-huh. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I yeah. Keep, I, yeah. I go on walks and encounter all these people that are not wearing masks and uh, it's upsetting. I've had to change uh, some of the places that I would walk just because it's, uh, yeah. it's so awkward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were, you know, we're here in Zion National Park. I was shocked how many people weren't wearing masks. Like, really shocked. I don't yeah. understand it. I guess they figure they're out in nature and uh, yeah. they have to. Huh? Yeah. But yeah, we, um, we believe in masks. We believe in science. And, and we, believe <laughs> in, we believe in trying to reduce the spread. You know, yeah. we believe that. We, yeah, me you know, too. I mean, it's, it's a temporary sacrifice and it won't be forever. But, yeah. Well, let's talk about your book a bit. Again, it's Rage Against the Minivan, Learning to Parent Without Perfection. And you've already talked a little bit about coming to uh, to realize that you can't do it all. You can't be perfect. Um, yes. I'm, I'm wondering, what does the minivan symbolize for you? <laughs> the minivan, I think, symbolized for me like this. I never wanted a minivan. I drive one. But to me, it just symbolized this sort of loss of identity, like becoming this sort of faceless, identity-less mother composite, you know. And so I, I just had these fears that like once I got the minivan, I would lose myself, you yeah. know. Yeah, that you would just be a suburban mom. Kind yeah, of exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yet you do have a minivan. <laughs> and yet I do. I mean, you know, I have four kids and those. It makes yeah, sense, those, right? It's yeah, practical. Those, those sliding doors that you can open from a button are pretty important yeah. as it turns out, especially when you have car seats and they're younger. But, um, you know, I mean, I've come to realize a minivan obviously doesn't define me in any significant way, but it still was kind of a tongue in cheek rebellion of becoming that. Yeah stereotypical faceless mother yeah now you're also a really good writer um has i guess has that been part of your composite all along or uh, you know was it difficult for you to write this book or easy and how did you squeeze it in with everything that's going yeah on? I didn't think of myself as a writer um at all but you know it's funny it actually really started from um when my kids were young, I would write these really sarcastic kind of tongue in cheek Christmas letters where I would sort of play off the way that people write the braggy Christmas letters, but I would make it really over the top, you know? So it's like my three-year-old had been accepted to Juilliard and, you know, and I would send these out just to friends and family. And so many friends and family were like, oh my gosh, you need to write. Like you need to be a writer. And I was like, I don't think so. That's not really my path. And then I did start a blog, but you know, that's what lots of moms were doing in the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, after a while notice like, oh, it's more than just my family reading this. And then it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And, and then it, the blog became a nice, source of income because I was struggling to, with four young kids to, to hold the same client load yeah. as a therapist that I did. So I started kind of pushing into blogging professionally and then, you know, it just kind of led to a book. 
Yeah, that's great. How, how do you blog professionally? You mean you found lots of advertisers who would? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for a season. I don't really blog, you know, blogging isn't really my source of income anymore, but there was a good, you know, decade there where, yeah, it was, you know, you would write, you know, you would write every day and then maybe once a week you would have a sponsored post where you would talk about a product and they would pay you or you could have sidebar ads. Um, so yeah, and it was, it was a nice, it was a nice side income that I could do while I was home with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe you also have a podcast. Is that right? I do. Well, tell us. Yes, I have a podcast. podcast. The podcast, give me one sec. I'm going to, um, I started podcasting when uh, nobody knew what a podcast was and I'd have yeah. to explain to <laughs> friends and family and so on yes. what a podcast was. <laughs> so that's really shifted. So tell us about your podcast. So my podcast is a bit of a departure because, you know, my blog and my book have been sort of focused on the mommy space and parenting. My podcast is all about self-care. And when I say self-care, I don't mean, you know, massages and bubble baths. Um, we are looking at like the deeper meanings of self-care. So we, um, we talk, I mean, we talk about relationships, we talk about boundaries, we talk about meditation, mindfulness. Um, we have a, a resident therapist who um, comes and kind of gives us a um, word of advice. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong, we do talk about serums and makeup sometimes as well. Um, we talk about hormones and health. So it's it's mind, body, and spirit is really what we're talking and about. And you say we. How many people are in the we? Yeah, so but my, um, it's myself, my co-host, Rue Powell, and then we have a resident therapist who's BJ Hickman, and then we have a resident esthetician, Claire um, Gilchrist, and so they take questions from our listeners. And then Rue and I are kind of the overall hosts. And Rue and I do a self-care check-in with each other every week. And we talk about how our own self-care is going. Uh -huh. And we are brutally honest and often uh -huh. failing. Um, and so it's, you know, a little bit too that exploration of why is self-care so hard for us? Because we all, you know, most of us know what we need to do. We just don't yeah. get there. So I, that was the interesting question to me as a therapist is, the why. Why are we struggling to take care of ourselves and what inner work needs to happen for us to prioritize ourselves? Uh -huh. uh, do you want to say any more about the book? Sure. So the book is, um, it's a humor memoir. It is, it, you know, it tells the, the story of my very nonlinear journey towards motherhood and the fact that I, you know, I got there in ways that were unexpected and had a lot of lessons along the way. Um, the book is also a permission slip for parents to learn how to let themselves off the hook. It is, you know, the mantra is that we can all be the world's okayest moms, you know, and that our, our kids actually, you know, they need our connection and they need our love, um, but they don't need us to be super moms. You know, they don't need us to meet all of these expectations that society is giving us. And so, you know, I help take the readers on a journey of figuring out what they want to opt into and what are the things they want to opt out of um, in order to parent well, but also stay sane and maintain some of their own sense of identity. Yeah, great. So uh, how can people find you? Yeah. Well, the book is available on Amazon. It's in Target. Everywhere books are sold. You can find me online. My website's kristenhowerton.com. And then I am at Kristen Howerton on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Okay, very good. Well, Kristen Howerton, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap yeah. Radio. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs>